All right, I just got some thumbs up, so I think we're ready to go. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Andrew Seaman. I am a medical journalist with Thompson Reuters here in New York. Uh, so I write about everything medicine, including LGBTQ health. And um, tonight we have a really fantastic panel that um, really includes everyone who would be involved with PrEP, uh, from the benefit side all the way to the doctor and the patient. So I'm really excited to have a great discussion. We're going to have um, a discussion that spans about 30 minutes, and then we're going to leave time for questions, because I'm pretty sure your questions will be better than mine. Uh, so we're uh, going to open it to you guys, and then we're also going to open it to uh, everyone who's on the webinar. Uh, but first, I want to quickly introduce everyone on the panel. So when I say your name, just give a quick wave. And uh, um, there is our package with the longer, very impressive biographical information, so I'm just going to give the short one. Um, and first up, we have Dr. Andrew Goodman, who is Associate Director of Medicine at Callen Lord Community Health Center here in New York. Um, we have Chris Hernandez, uh, who is writer, comedian, and a current prep user, who will be giving us the consumer side of prep. And then next to me, we have Christina Barrera, uh, who is the Transgender HIV Prevention Coordinator, Gender, um, also involved with the Gender Identity Project um, at the Lesbian Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Community Center, which is right here, where we're having the panel. Um, we have William J. Nazareth, Jr., uh, who's director of Creative Media at Callum Lord. He also um, built the prep program at Callum Lord, so he's a great resource. Um, and uh, then we have Doug Worth, who is president and CEO of Media Care, who is also co-sponsoring uh, the event tonight at Callum Lord. And if you can't hear us or uh, anything like that, just let us know because we have to talk right into it. William, the first question, uh, I'm going to start with you. So, yeah. Uh, and this is a question that I get a lot from my friends. They hear PrEP and then they hear true body. So, can you tell us a little bit about what? You know, what is PrEP and what is TrueBot? Is there a distinction? So, you know, what's the difference? So, PrEP is free exposure of blood. And what it is, is a medication that is made consistently and correctly and protects you from HIV and fever fluid. Right now, TrueBot is the medication that has been used to work effectively as PrEP. And so, I guess I mean that. You know, in the future, there could actually be other things that come down the line to be added to the correct category, right? Yeah, so if you follow research at all, if you're that kind of thing, then you know that other medications are being stored currently. Uh, there are lots of clinical trials that are happening to see if there are other options for standing to press uh, yes, uh, options. Okay. okay. And then, uh, Dr. Goodman, I, I guess the one of the things is for people who get, you know, prescription of true bottle, um, they'll notice that generic name may actually sound familiar because it's not necessarily a new drug. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how it actually works in the body and, um, you know, if there's anything that people should um, sort of know going into the doctor's office? Absolutely. Well, um, as you mentioned, true bottle being the brand name for the drug, um, Tenofovir and Emtricide means the combination of two medications in this one pill that's taken once a day, very commonly used in HIV treatment as well. That's the thing that I think sometimes may surprise people um, when they get the prescription back and they're going to read about how good it is in HIV treatment. This is another use for it that we've kind of discovered over time um, using this medication for HIV prevention. Really, um, as far as how the medication works, um, one of the things that we've known for quite a while when it comes to HIV, um, someone newly becoming positive, when HIV first gets into the body, there's probably a good 15 to 20 days before um, the virus winds up being spread throughout the entire body. Um, and that period of time really probably represents a good opportunity to actually block HIV from getting into the body, getting into the body's immune system, spreading throughout the entire body, and really getting to a point where there's not anything that we can do to completely eliminate the infection. Sorry for the word infection, I don't like it, but that's the question that we have. Um, at that point, plenty we can do to keep it under control, 
and definitely help promote a person's health. But I don't think we can do to really eliminate it at that point. Um, you know, for me, the idea for PrEP really was born out of post-exposure prophylaxis. PEP, which many people may be familiar with that idea, that's taking medication immediately after an exposure to the same thing, block it from really getting into the body's immune system and spreading throughout the entire body. So it's really an extension of that idea for me, saying kind of why wait for that exposure to happen, let's just have you on the medication every day. And it's, um, when you go into the doctor's office, that's, it, it's pretty important to get basically a, a baseline test, right, uh, for negative status, so you're not getting on Truvada um, when you actually it's positive, right? Correct. Um, so as far as things to anticipate when going into the doctor's office or the provider's office, one thing um, I think to know right away is you're probably not going to walk out that day with a prescription uh, for Truvada. There is some testing that needs to be done. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that many of the HIV tests that we have available, particularly many of the rapid ones, these third generation rapid ones, really are only going to tell me um, about any sex that a person or exposure that a person may have had probably after about one to two months ago, if that makes any sense, or this concept of a rumor period. It takes probably at least a month or two for those tests to become positive. Um, so that many of the tests that I have to use in order to determine that a person is HIV negative, because we would not want to use these drugs for someone who was already positive, it wouldn't be enough um, to really fully treat someone who was positive. Um, but, but those tests do take some time to get those results back, in addition to some other tests for other infections that we definitely want to make sure that we do before getting someone started on this medication. And then, you know, this is a question that I asked a few people, you know, if you had a question about PrEP, what would it be? And this was we number one, do you still have to use copper? I think this was really yes. Um, I would absolutely recommend using condoms for uh, people for many different reasons. Um, for one, obviously HIV is not the only sexually transmitted infections. We do want to make sure to do what we can to help protect folks um, against other sexually transmitted infections. I don't really want a person to necessarily be on PrEP for forever um, as well. And generally, I want to work with individuals to try and develop other safer sex tools so that we don't have to take a medication every day to prevent HIV. Also, understand the reality that for most people, that's something that takes some time. Um, something that may be a choice as well that we kind of want to work with for a period of time. And I think the last one, and, and you know, I don't say this necessarily to have everyone like afraid to touch another human being, but remember that HIV was probably out there for a good 10 or 15 years before anybody recognized it. And again, this is not to like make you feel terrified. It's something else out there that we just don't know about yet, or the things that we have yet to learn about. So I encourage folks to do what you can. Um, so and a good example of that would be, you know, the meningitis uh, outbreak that was a few years earlier. So that's something where it's population specific. Absolutely. And um, I guess, you know, another question for William and then Katina, you know, who should be on PrEP? Because there was some big news recently where the CDC came out and said, you know, that a, a substantial number of LGBT people shouldn't be on PrEP. So, you know, who, who's the target population? So, I mean, in response to that question, I think my first thought is that really PrEP is for everyone to consider. I think that there are populations in the rest of the group that have higher risk for HIV based on who they have sex with, the communities they live in, and these are reasons to consider PrEP. At the end of the day, PrEP is really a choice for everyone to make because we can all contribute to any evidence. However, we do need to acknowledge that, you know, young men of color, young MSN of color, um, have really, really high infection rates, right? Um, disproportionate to their existence as a population in the country. And so that means that, you know, some populations may need to be more aware of prevention tools so that they can sort of survive, right? Um, but at the same time, we don't want to lose sight that um, making prep just for one population means that other populations shouldn't consider it or think about it because everyone is at risk. And so uh, to add to that, um, with the work that we're doing here at the LGBT Center, um, you know, we 
work to empower uh, the trans community around you know, living healthier lives. So what we're talking about is um, if they're having sex, and if they're having sex with uh, multiple partners, and um, if they're also, um, you know, using substances, and those may be, you know, um, reasons why to consider PrEP. Um, the way we sell it to them, because, you know, PrEP is something new uh, to the trans community. Historically, it wasn't really that, in, you know, targeted to be used by the trans community. So the way we, we propose it to our community is by letting them know, you know, um, having access to a pill that can keep you negative would make sex more enjoyable, you know. Of course, we want you to continue to practice safer sex, but accidents do happen, and they happen all the time with different people, and knowing that they have that control, that control to take a pill a day, and knowing that they have that layer of protection makes it easier for them. Um, you know, we work with a lot of, um, you know, sex, uh, sex workers, uh, individuals that um, do sex work for survival, and a lot of times, you know, um, that pill can be, you know, an, a, a sense of a, a negotiation that they could have with their clients. Because the reality is, is that we, most of us probably know about it, you know, that's been documented that, um, you know, a lot of times if the individual, you know, doesn't have the leverage to negotiate paper, paper sex, it's the difference between having access to a home, having access to their um, sensation-related treatment, and so what we tell them is consider prep as an option, you know. Consider taking a pill if you have to make exceptions or you have to negotiate down with a client. At least you'll know that you'll have that protection, you know, and, and, and get, monitored, um, get monitored regularly so that way if um, anything else comes up, you know, you, you, get, you get it treated right away. So but we use that as a, a tool to keep our community safe. And um, Chris, you know, we were just, you know, one of the things that came up is sort of targeting populations in, in terms of who's at most risk. And I guess, you know, how did you hear about PrEP? I think my first exposure to the concept of PrEP was probably through Facebook. I'm friends with a lot of gay men, and I probably saw an influx of articles about, about it as a possible tool for prevention. And then, so clicking on those articles kind of led me to my own exploration of this, uh, of Brett and Shivada. And I guess, you know, when you, um, you know, on the, the same topic, you know, how did you go about pursuing that? You know, was it sort of an easy decision for you, or? It absolutely was not an easy decision for me. It was very, um, one thing, like, I, I'm not an expert on anything. I can only offer my personal experience uh, with this. And I think, at first, the most thing that caught my attention was the, I guess, the moral implications of it and the controversy that surrounded it. Like, that interested me most at first, I think, because um, I didn't register as an option for me, because I assumed that it was not something that I'd be able to afford. So I just got kind of interested in the, um, the controversy of what it was. And uh, of course, the interest of like what a historical thing this is, and so I got caught up into that, and that kind of like I got some information through that, and it wasn't until I had started seeing a doctor at Town Lord that I was kind of like guided to that being a personal option for me. Um, I don't know if I made that specific enough, or if you yeah, no, more specific the question of like how that they went about it, or yeah, no, and so once you got found more, I guess that sort of you know through evaluation and things like that, that sort of follows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I made it sound good because I had um, I mean it's in my bio somewhat, you know, like I had a lot of problems like addiction in my past, and when I kind of got clean, I wanted to take um, I wanted to see a doctor and kind of like get my my health looked into. And I remember one of the stocks with a lot of fear and shame over the lifestyle that I had led. And when I was going through this process of um, being asked questions about my sex life, uh, I remember the doctor changing his tone, and I definitely felt judged uh, during this process. And it really traumatized me 
um, and prevented me from seeking health care after that. You know, I was like, you already go there vulnerable and scared and possibly ashamed, and to have someone judge you just really affects me in a bad way. So I found a way to come more, knowing that they catered towards more like LGBT, uh, the, the community, and um, through that I was able to start a process, it's still an ongoing process, of being honest with a professional about um, my potential risks and the uh, choices that I make. And through that relationship, I was, um, my doctor just thought I asked me, have we talked about that? And that was kind of like the door that opened. I'm like, you mean I can talk about it with you? You know, like until that point, I didn't know that it would be accessible to someone like me. You know? Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. And I guess, uh, you know, one of the questions I think that comes up a lot, especially in the U.S., where, you know, we have to pay for all this stuff. Um, you know, how would you describe access to, to PrEP? Because it's one of those things where, um, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of people, when they read stories about it, they'll see maybe a wholesale price of drug, and they'll think it's, you know, prohibitive um, of them getting it. How would you describe access to PrEP now in terms of the, you know, provide in the payer landscape? So I think, you know, if you look at uh, data that we have in New York, going back to 2013, the state has documented that about 260 people gained uh, PrEP through the Medicaid program in, in New York. That number is over 1,700 in 2015 and growing. So one of the things we need to really educate ourselves in the community is that uh, PrEP is a covered Medicaid benefit. Um, your PCP can, uh, your primary care provider can, uh, those initials are many different uh, meetings, right? The primary care provider um, can uh, prescribe uh, PrEP. Uh, and if you have Medicaid, um, it's a, a guaranteed access through the Medicaid program. And health plans, uh, what we need to know is that health plans actually can't get in the way of uh, community members and their provider. The provider says it's needed, the consumer says that they want it, and they have Medicaid, um, it, it will, should be covered. And if people have issues with that, um, we should definitely uh, definitely talk about it. Then there are drug assistance programs uh, through, uh, through the manufacturer. And there's also funding uh, through our governor and our mayor in terms of the, and the epidemic blueprint uh, to make PrEP available for people uh, who don't have Medicaid uh, or can't get drug assistance through the manufacturer. So there are multiple ways to gain, to gain access. Um, so, uh, you know, the biggest thing is to start a conversation with uh, a provider who's sensitive and can bring a non-judgmental attitude. That's the most important first step. Um, and we in the community, there are lots of ways to participate. And I guess, you know, um, my question would be, you know, if, if someone, you know, got to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, I'm a great candidate for PrEP, um, and, you know, there are maybe some hoops to jump through to get, get it, um, would you say that most people walking out with a prescription should be able to find some way to pay for it through, you know, today's insurance landscape with, you know, through Medicaid or private insurance and, you know, uh, sort of programs? I think that um, people working with their provider uh, can gain a payer access, that costs should not be prohibitive um, to getting access to it. And, and we can help people and we can find ways and we can advocate with health insurance plans. You know, if you just look at the cost benefit analysis to a health plan, if you pay for PrEP for five years on a monthly basis, let's say at the current cost that was $60,000 in PrEP treatment costs uh, for that five-year period. The, if you prevent the HIV infection, so, and maybe somebody might need 20, 30, 40 years worth of HIV meds at $2,400 a month, that, that's, you know, almost $600,000. And then you add in other kinds of medical costs you spend 60 and you prevent a million dollars worth of expenditures. It's right for people, it's right for providers, and it's right for New York State to pay for that. And, it, and I think you mentioned before, um, it's sort of a cornerstone of the states um, and the epidemic um, program, correct? Yes. Um, and, and, that is, and, and I guess, 
Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I know we'll probably hear maybe a little bit about that tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think uh, if you're available tomorrow, you should come to the Palo Theater on the 25th Street and join a bigger conversation around ending the epidemic. The governor will be there. Um, I believe the mayor will be there. The governor just announced today $200 million annually worth of new money to fund the end the epidemic blueprint. Basically, people in the community came together and put forward uh, a host of recommendations to our governor in less than you know, 90 days. Uh, many of us were, were a part of that process. And PrEP, making PrEP available to people who are negative. So the goal of the blueprint is to reduce new HIV infections, which are right now are about 3,000 uh, new infections a year, um, down to below 750. A major part of getting there is to make PrEP available to the people who are negative and to support people who already know that they're positive to gain access the medication to help them bring the virus so low in the body, they call it undetectable, that transmission is very, very, very unlikely. And that's the way we're going to end this epidemic. And, um, Christina, one of the things that I, I was wondering, too, is because we were talking about targeting different populations, um, you know, in the transgender community, you have a lot of people coming asking about PrEP, or, you know, is it something that tends to be initiated, you know, during a, a healthcare system, you say? Um, I, over the, the last year, year and a half, I've seen that there is a little bit more of, um, uh, you know, a request of conversation around that, but I don't really think we have reached our ideal potential. Um, there is still a lot of ignorance around PrEP. Um, there is still a lot of fear uh, from the trans community around, you know, having to deal with the stigma of taking an HIV medication. So what we're doing is we're constantly, you know, uh, promoting, you know, discussions around, you know, what it means to, you know, be HIV negative, what it means to be HIV positive, ways that we can, you know, stay safe and stay healthy. And we try to introduce, um, you know, the, the prep, you know, the prep language into a lot of that. Um, you know, we we use a lot of um, community testimonials because a lot of times um, we see that um, hearing from our peers around something that that works and something that's new uh, really makes a difference. And so that has really um, made it easier for people to consider connecting to prep. Um, you know, we work with a lot of our individuals who are engaging in sex work, so we're like constantly, you know, sharing that option with them, you know. We really want them to be informed around having that, you know, that tool to stay safe. Um, you know, just personally for me, I had three close friends um, diagnosed this year alone, um, being HIV positive, and, um, you know, for me as a, as, a, as a community educator, you know, it makes me wonder, you know, could I have done more around getting that information to the community? You know? Could I have been able to um, just, um, you know, try to work to knock a lot of those um, false um, perceptions around prep? So I think that we still need a lot of work to be done, especially in outside my hands. And the other boroughs, um, that information is not really getting across. And so we need to educate more people. And, you know, um, you know, going in line with it, um, the end of the epidemic, I think we're going to be able to do that because we're hoping and we're seeing that more resources will be allocated to educate more people. You know, PrEP is not just for people who are LGBT or people who are, you know, you know, who are men who are having sex with men, you know, PrEP is for everyone who's having sex and who's engaging in, in some risk activities. And so, you know, it could really be beneficial to a lot of And I know when PrEP first came out, there were uh, um, a ton of articles uh, from, I guess, my fellow journalists and just people writing in the news that um, I, you know, I personally remember, you know, articles saying, you know, PrEP made me have the worst stomach pain that I've ever had in my life, and then other people saying, you know, I felt fine. Um, and 
I guess, you know, Dr. Goodman, what, you know, what are the side effects? And are there any precautions when you're on the drug that you need to know about? Couple of things that we have to pay attention to. Um, certainly, taking this medication. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, in part of the initial testing that a person has to do, um, one of the things we want to look out for is uh, infection with hepatitis B. Um, only because the same medication, Truvada, has a drug that's used to treat hepatitis B. Um, there's some very important things in knowing whether or not that's something that that someone has when it comes to starting this medication. Kidney function testing is another one that we need to pay attention to, um, which how Truvada, it's one of the medications in Truvada affects kidneys, is for the most part kind of a quirky thing. Not anything that I've really found that send people to like kidney failure or to dialysis or anything like that, but I think that we need to pay attention to and certainly need to know if someone is already having trouble with their kidneys before getting started. Um, there are, Definitely um, a lot known about how this medication may affect bone density, but in most folks and most individuals, I don't see this being a problem, um, anything that, that we necessarily have to address, something though probably worth exploring uh, before starting um, the medication. As far as side effects, I, I have to say, um, again, this is a medication that's used for a lot of HIV treatments. And in most HIV treatments, this is not the drug that causes any side effects or any issues at all. Um, occasionally, with folks who are taking PrEP, we might hear some gastrointestinal side effects, maybe a bit of stomach upset, uh, maybe a bit of nausea while taking the medication. I think it's rare that for anyone that one of the so severe that they stop taking the medication. I think I've had a lot of people come back and tell me, too, they feel like while they're taking the medication, it's caused them to experience um, dreams much more vividly, which is not a, the drug that we usually think of as causing uh, this reaction. Um, but again, it's never been so severe for anyone that they decide, decided to stop taking the medication. Um, I think for most people, um, it, it's actually with a relatively without side effects. And they find it pretty easy to take. And uh, Chris, I guess, you know, um, how are you feeling? Still on it. About a year and a half, then I believe. And uh, I think it was a tr uh, an adjustment period at first. Um, I think the I I just have gastrointestinal issues in general, so it's hard for me to kind of uh, distinguish like is this prep or is this just what I ate this morning, you know? Um, and I think in the beginning I felt maybe a little out of it, for lack of a technical term. I maybe like overheated at certain points because it was in the summer when I went on it. Um, but it's definitely not anything that I notice anymore. I just kind of try to not take it too close to when I take my food or not an empty stomach. And um, and I seem to be quite fine. Yeah. And William, you know, I guess um, since you basically built the prep program at Common Lord, you know, when it comes to reaching people who should be on prep, you know, what do you think are the next steps? Um, you know, what, you know, should, is it a lot of word of mouth? Um, you know, and I guess, you know, is it going out to the outer boroughs, is it going to rural communities, things like that? Well, I mean, I think that education is key. We have to start thinking of using the methods that other industries use to share information. Right? When we think about the music industry, they are experts. When we think about clothing and retail, right? They're really good at getting us to be very aware of stores and sales and products and you know, the newest album that's coming out. And so that's why, you know, we really embark on the Park 101 video series as a way of doing that. You know, at Colorado, we really do believe that, you know, we have to use the methods that people are actually accessing um, in order to educate people. And so social media is one of those methods. And so Park 101 is really focused on the idea that it's fun, you're learning about prep, and anyone can watch it and feel safe. There's no pressure, it's not too serious so that you feel a little uncomfortable, there's no stigma, and you can begin to learn. And if it's a little bit fun, then you share it, right? And so then people want to watch it because it's a little bit funny to them, or they just love the production quality. And so as it reaches more people, people would never walk through our door. They may not even exist. Or they may not have the, the, the means to get to us, 
they get exposed to that information. So we really have to be very creative. We have to take advantage of every tool to share information and educate the masses. And when we reach community members, we didn't even tell our community members because they don't show up after. And the, you know, I guess two questions, you know, would be um, from the insurance side, is the insurance industry, do you think, educating people about PrEP adequately? Because, you know, like you said, you know, PrEP and upfront costs will prevent downstream costs later on. Um, and then, you know, one thing that I noticed is that, you know, if you're getting PrEP uh, because it is a specialty medication, sometimes pharmacy benefits um, are an issue. So, you know, do you, are there ways around that? And what advice would you have for people if they're getting, if they're having trouble with pharmacy benefits or, you know, if at the register, what should they do? So, you know, the interesting thing about health insurance in this country, in this country right, is so much of it is on a for profit basis. So let me ask this audience for some patience. How many of you think that health insurance plans, by and large, are doing massive education about this new thing that they're not presently spending on? <laughs> so, you know, we laugh, uh, uh, but uh, unfortunately, I think that many insurance companies are short-sighted. They're in the immediate sort of what it costs now. So I think that it's really a groundswell effort of, of the community and our providers who are serving us, us getting in conversation with them and us driving the same way. Um, I was just thinking back in 1991, I was arrested in Grand Central Station for the dubious act of handing out condoms and lubrication during the 10 days and week campaign that GMHC had sponsored. There was a time when we weren't talking about condoms and they were not readily available. And this is people who are in this room and people who are, are not in this room uh, stood up and said, uh, this is a new prevention tool. We must make it available. We must be talking about sexual health. We must uh, be getting our providers to talk about things that they're not comfortable with. So that's the, the one message I would say is we need to drive uh, health insurance and payers and government to do the right thing by our community. The plan um, will, uh, so uh, HIV medications in the U.S. state, in the Medicaid program, uh, plans are required to pay for them if providers prescribe. So PrEP is one of those uh, covered medications. I think some insurance plans could direct people to certain pharmacies to fill that. So, you know, those are all, all considerations that people are going to uh, need to, to make in terms of where they fill the medications. And for some people, they don't want to go and fill that medication, not in a local pharmacy, but they might want to go to a larger train somewhere, not in their neighborhood, to get that filled. And, and we ought to be able to have those, those kinds of options. I think if you have a problem in, uh, in a pharmacy, um, one of the things that I would do is I pull out my cell phone and I call my plan and I complain to my plan. Um, and I would ask them for help. And if they were not responsive, I go to my medical provider and say, um, I had a bad experience at this pharmacy. They gave me a hassle. Um, you know, they called my name and, uh, you know, does work your providers ready, you know, for pickup? And that could be a really alarming uh, experience. And so, you know, the world is not, you know, prep ready. We're going to make the world prep ready, um, and nobody else is going to do it uh, but, but us. And the last thing I would say is, you know, I, I remember probably a decade ago, um, I was in a magnetic couple. Anybody know what a magnetic couple is? Come on. <laughs> no? So, you know, magnetic plus and minus? Yes. Right? So I, uh, uh, my partner um, was positive, I was negative, and the condom broke. And so one of the other things I think we need to seriously be talking about um, is that as we partner, as we get in relationships, as we fall in love with 
people um, who ring all the bells and, and no longer is HIV status to decide about whether we partner with people. We also need to understand that that becomes a real meaningful thing that supports people who are, the old language was zero discordant. I hated that. It's like, why should we be discordant? Because we got a different HIV status. We're magnetic. We're powerful. We're attracted to each other. And so that's another reason why we need to be having conversations around that. Yeah, that is a really great term. <laughs> that's better than zero discordant. Um, and then um, I think we have to transition to um, audience question. And I think the mic over here is for audience questions. So I'm going to ask one more question to the panel. But if you have questions, if you want to make your way over to this microphone over here, um, that'd be great. And uh, the last question is for Dr. Goodman. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people come to Allen Lord uh, for medical care, but then there's obviously people that go to private providers and other clinics around the city. And you know, if that provider isn't necessarily educated about PrEP, you know, how does a patient go in there um, and ask about it? You know, should they sort of guide the, the practitioner through that, or do you, should they seek out somebody like Allen? I think there are many answers to that question. That depends first in part on what kind of relationship you have with your provider. I, I, I hear many times people who come to me and will say, mm, I really want to try, but I couldn't talk with my provider about this. I couldn't, I, you know, people even say to me, I can't disclose to them information about my sexual history or who I'm attracted to. My first answer to that is, what are you doing with this provider then if you can't open up in these ways? I, mean, I feel like that's such an important part of your health care. Um, but many people, for many reasons, you know, don't want to break that relationship. If you feel empowered to go talk with your provider, I think there are many different resources to use. Um, you know, certainly, there are consultation services available for providers to call and look and get more information. Um, the CDC has a uh, pretty um, good, a, a very good uh, guideline available on their website that you can refer a provider to as well, which has a lot of information about everything that needs to be done um, and, and all the monitoring and everything that goes into prescribing that. Um, there are also many different um, uh, practices out there, Town Lord being one, who offer services for folks strictly for PrEP. So basically saying you don't have to come here and make yourself um, fully a patient, but we will help you um, navigate PrEP. And, and that may be a resource to take a look at this one. Okay, great. And I know I've actually uh, sent the CDC guidelines, which are readily available on the website to provider or two, um, to say, hey, just so you know, this is what the CDC says. And, you know, that can I think, you know, one of the things uh, I encourage people to say is ask your provider, what do you know about PrEP? And the provider says they don't know anything or a whole lot. Um, I encourage people to ask their provider, would you be willing to learn and get educated? Uh, and if the provider says no, um, then I might encourage people to reconsider that, that relationship. There are a lot of resources. There, there are trainings that uh, are done by manufacturers. There are community events. Where our particular health plan is um, offering CME dinners for primary care providers to actually come and learn um, outside of the patient provider conversations where people can, you know, providers uh, it might be surprised sometimes to have things that they can consider dumb questions. They they're scared to ask. They're they're they think they're supposed to know everything about that. And so um, I think that we can also provide just safe environments for them to ask their questions and and, and to get educated. But that, I mean, uh, ultimately, providers are there uh, to serve uh, people. And I think uh, if a provider is unwilling to learn, um, get the information to help you, um, there are other providers across New York City that people, that people can go to. And Town Lord is one of them. And um, we're, it's our mission to actually see that every single community health center um, uh, across New York City has a qualified PrEP prescribing primary care provider 
in it by 2000, by the close of 2016. Okay. Well, and I guess, do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Can you use the mic? Or do you want to just shout and I'll repeat it? We want to hear your beautiful voice as a sort of people. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. So they say that I'm actually positive, right? They say that. So my partner is like negative. And that bottom is the top. Will it be safe if we are in a relationship that he is prep and I use a condom? First of all, um, you know, I think when it comes to talking about risk, we, we can't talk about things in kind of black and white terms, right? Where we're really dealing with odds, we're dealing with statistics here. Um, one of the things that we do know in, in magnetic uh, relationships, um, certainly couples as well, where one person is positive, one person is negative. The positive person is on medication, their virus is undetectable. That greatly, greatly decreases the chances of the positive person um, or the negative person becoming positive um, as a result of that relationship. But greatly, greatly, right? I, I wouldn't necessarily say zero in that situation. Um, so when we're talking about PrEP here, kind of in these contexts, the thing to remember is that this is one additional tool that's available to us of, of many things that we have available to decrease risk um, for HIV infection. You know, the, the only thing I think that we really have available that's like guaranteed, you know, 100% is probably our own hands, um, and that's about it. Um, that, that, that was a failed reference to that. <laughs> 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 um, or um, but you know, that's, that's the way that I view these things and encourage people to hear this. Um, I think one of the other things you were getting to do is kind of the situation where the positive person is the, um, the top and the negative person oh, is the bottom. The, the positive person is the bottom, so he's the receiver. Oh, okay. Is it from the bottom of the Yes, technically compared to the other way around, yes, we'll talk about that being less of a risk. Is that so substantial of a decrease in risk that you really can kind of throw out other risk reduction tools? I, I would advise no in that situation. I still think you have to think about those things. Um, that the risk is still there, it's still substantial. I definitely have folks who have come to me who have become positive as a result of objective sex being the top, being the insert part. Okay. And there are, in, um, just from covering research, there are cases in the trials or prep or even recent studies where there are true prep, what are called true prep failures, right? Where someone will be on prep and usually you know, but somehow they do um, become HIV positive during the study. Right? Or at least, I, I don't know if you've seen those, but I know I've reported it before. I, I mean, I, I think in many of the trials, I, I don't know that any of them are able to distill down right to the level of the individual what caused a person to become HIV positive in that situation. Um, you know, we, we chalk a lot of that up to questions about adherence to the medication. Um, you know, and many other issues. I also think a lot of the studies have been done, probably have not been large enough just yet to really capture these. But you may have read the studies that I haven't, so I also leave with that. And all right, any next question? Do we have anything come online? I have, yes. Yeah, one from the webinar um, asking about how we can provide PrEP, uh, more information about PrEP to sexually active women. So it seems to be something that is not necessarily as much of a focus they're pointing out. Okay. Um, well, I would say, again, PREP 101, um, that's really the goal of PREP 101. We really try to include a diverse cast of um, what we call the students learning about PREP, and that includes women of all experiences, um, sexual orientation, and race, class. None of those things really matter um, when it comes to educating an individual about PREP. And so I think that, um, one, you know, we do need to make efforts to reach specific communities. So, you know, the thing that we've already been doing for years, we need to continue doing, but we need to continue to add new tools like using social media, like creating um, either directed campaigns or inclusive campaigns so that people feel safe accessing either, right? Because we can't assume that um, a campaign that looks like me is going to speak to me. It's because someone looks like me in the ad. Um, I may be more comfortable with something that's more inclusive, but in the same 
you know, on the flip side of the coin, I may be looking for something out of the game for me to feel like I can really do that situation. Um, and I know that there are multiple people who are trying to do more education around prior four. And the tagline for the videos is that, you know, everyone should consider prep, but not, it's not necessarily for Exactly. Yes. I had a question about uh, interactions with other medication, and um, specifically uh, as far as trans community goes, uh, HRT, if that interacts in any way. Sure, uh, that's, that's a very good question, um, and that's one of the questions that um, we hear from uh, our clients around: Am I going to be jeopardizing my transition, or is that going to affect you know my um, liver function, kidney function? And from um, many other stories that I heard from um, clients who are on PrEP and from different providers, um, from what I hear, it has been proven that it doesn't affect it. You know, they still monitor for all the different, um, you know, like liver function, kidney function, and everything. But um, they said that it goes hand in hand. You know, because it would be worse if the person becomes HIV positive and then they have to be taken much more medication to, you know, to take care of. Uh, of our suppression, and so um, I, from um, you know from um, uh, like a harm reduction, it's, it's better to be on prep, and um, as long as the person adheres to treatment and they follow routine uh, medical checkups, it shouldn't um, negatively impact them. Um, sorry, I just wanted to comment about well, if, if we can hear a bit more, and you mentioned it, Christina about stigma and how big of an issue is the stigma and the perceptions that other people have when, when you know, you might tell them, I'm on prep. And, you know, they have certain perceptions about that person's lifestyle, et cetera. So how big of an issue you see, uh, you see, um, yeah, you consider stigma in the community right now around prep and yeah, just if you can comment on that. Thank you. Sure, I would like to say a few things. Um, so when it comes to, um, you know, what we're hearing and we're also hearing it from, uh, you know, some of the uh, amorous partners is that a lot of times when um, individuals disclose that they're on PrEP, a lot of times, you know, um, people are quick to make judgments. They automatically assume that the person is being promiscuous or the person is being, you know, like a... Uh, Risky, um, and uh, from what I've seen uh, firsthand from uh, the different individuals that I work with, is that you know it's more about control, like sexual health control, around like um, taking care of their health better. It doesn't really translate into like taking more risk. Um, what we do um, see is that um, when it comes to like um, partners. Um, if, you know, if individuals are, you know, having multiple partners, we talk to um, our community members around, you know, being cautious around disclosing um, being on PrEP because a lot of times what we're hearing is that from partners and they're becoming more aware of PrEP, they, they, they want to negotiate down the condom too, mm -hmm. so they, 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 um, they, they don't want to use condoms. And then that creates a whole set of problems. So we tell um, a lot of the women who are, you know, engaging in sex work, you know, try not to share that information with clients because otherwise um, they will expect for you, you know, kind of not to be you. And that can create a whole set of problems. I think I want to touch on that a little bit just because um, the stigma of it is was a large hurdle that I had to cross before I decided to go on for it. And um, I mean, I think it's important to acknowledge that we just live in a society that is really big on slut shaming its women and gay men. So just being a sexual being, there's already a stigma attached to you. Um, but that stigma does not change the fact that we are going to engage in sex. And I do live at, at PrEP as a, an other tool in the line of defense. You know, for me, what it came down to is like, um, it doesn't matter what other people think of me. Like, this is me putting the powers in my own hands to protect myself and those I choose to engage with. You know, um, I really just looked at the history of the gay community and, you know, the losses that 
We certainly aim to aid, and then just the stigma that's attached to the gay community since then, and the fear of just like growing up in that community to be like, if I have sex, I'm going to get AIDS and die. Um, I felt like going into it, I knew the choices that I tended to make, and I knew the feelings that I felt every time I would get an HIV test, the dread and the fear and the shame that came over me. And um, when my doctor prescribed it, it became a financial thing. I didn't know how much my copay was going to be. And um, it said, she said, it could be anywhere between $10 and $100. I was like, all right, if it's 10 I can do it. If it's 100 I can't. Um, and when I went to pick it up, it was, it was $35. And that, I wasn't prepared for that. I was like, wait, it was 10 or 100 I, what do I do? But luckily, like, in that moment, I just had this, like, window of, like, I thought of the, the other anxiety and that fear that I had when I was waiting for those test results. And I was like... You know what, $35 a month is worth never having to feel that again, regardless of what my sex practices are. You know, and um, for other people to throw words or terms at me, it's like, that's their prerogative. You know, like, I know that I'm doing the best that I can take care of myself, and I can, you know, represent that side of it. Like, I don't tell people that I'm on it um, unless I'm going to engage with them sexually, because I feel like that is a right that they have to know. But, you know, I don't need people... I think you can control the information that you give and take about yourself. And I think most importantly, it's empowering to choose to take care of yourself. So. And I, I think a good also way to approach it is when Dr. Goodman was talking about Chris, um, you know, when I was on PrEP, that's how I described it to people with sort of a dangerous risk, uh, where, you know, if you're using condoms, your risk is low. But if you add PrEP to that, makes it goes low. So, you know, you're protecting your health and you're decreasing your I don't think anyone should argue with you at that point you have. Um, so that's usually how, how I approach it, as sort of well, lowering my risk every one might to lower the risk of their health. Um, and finally, it was a follow-up question on this. But I'm curious if anyone on the panel has experienced how San Francisco has created a more accepting environment and broader base uptake of Trump than New York. If there's any sense of what that probably been able to reduce that signal more quickly than we have. Can we repeat the question? Okay, yeah. So basically, in, correct me if I'm wrong, um, basically, um, why and how do we correct the, the perception that San Francisco has lower stigma uh, to prep um, before New York, or maybe it's not even still at the same baseline? Or, you know, in San Francisco, prep is probably more accepted or what we talk about than here in New York, right? I can tell you, um, you know, this is the Thanksgiving holiday with uh, a group of about uh, 10 uh, gay brothers having a post Thanksgiving rant about what it was like back home with family members. Um, and the, the conversation of uh, prep came up, and I, I was actually quite surprised. Um, at some of the responses, um, I, I no longer sort of fit into the young demographic. I'm a little bit uh, uh, north, of, north of that. Uh, but I see a guy who works in their 40s and 50s uh, whose uh, sort of immediate reaction was that somehow it was irresponsible or that somehow. Um, and so I think that we've got a lot of work to do here in New York across all age groups to change the conversation around is it bad or is it good to a conversation that says it's one tool. You should know all of your options. You ought to have an informed conversation with your providers and uh, partners, uh, regular partners, if that's the case. And then you get to decide. And you know what? If you decide that it's right for you, we ought to stand up and applaud that person's personal process and journey of taking care of them and contributing to the health and well-being of our community. That's where we need to get. And I think that San Francisco has advanced conversations uh, across community-based organizations, across age groups, um, and they uh, just gotten faster to a place that we can get. It's going to happen because you guys came to this and you're going to talk 
to see people and people are watching them. So we're going to change it one person at a time, and that person we need to sort of work it out at first is ourselves. And and when we get right with ourselves about the conversation that it's a tool, and you choose the right tools for you, then uh, we're going to we're going to make sense on stigma and discrimination inside our own communities against our brothers and sisters. And I think also regarding San Francisco specifically, I think one of the things that they did was they did a lot of early research. Um, so they have Kaiser Permanente, which is basically easy to be helping for most of, the, most of um, that part of the state. Uh, so they had clinics that were literally just giving prep away as part of research studies. Um, so I think the introduction of prep was a lot um, faster and probably more dispersed than it was in New York, um, just because you had a lot of research dollars being uh, sent into the community to find out if PrEP actually worked in the real world setting. Um, so I think that may have been a better. Um, there's another question from that. Oh, okay. Do I use Mike? Uh, I apologize ahead of time. Um, but for those who kind of feel that they are less at risk for contracting HIV due to their sexual preferences, you know, like uh, people in heterosexual relationships or um, a lot of times their first thought is to you know, do plan B, to work pregnancy, a lot of times they don't think about HIV risk. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the medication used for PrEP is the same as what she used for PEP. So, um, is it possible for people who feel that they are at less risk to go ahead and get prep and only use it to feel that they expose and do the three-day regimen? We actually exchanged an email about the study results that came out earlier this year, um, and also you can probably talk a little bit about medication. Yeah. Yeah. You bring a lot of very good points with that. First of all, just, just this concept of risk in general, like what is an acceptable level of risk, right? It is, and you know, who should be on PrEP? I, I think that question is actually a lot trickier than it might seem at first. I mean, you, you would not arbitrarily draw a line, for instance, to say, well, you only have sex with 15 people and protected this month, so you're not high risk enough to go on PrEP. Like, but 16, good, so you know, get out there. Um, it, it, it kind of, I feel like there's a lot of that that is a very individual decision or decision that you work on with your provider. What is the level of risk that is acceptable to you um, to consider using this medication? Um, and as you rightly point out, there may be a number of people who are in relationships that maybe aren't traditionally thinking of um, as high risk for the use of PrEP, but it may still be an entirely appropriate thing to use. Um, your question, your comments about the post-exposure prophylaxis or the PEP. So as a reminder, that is um, something happened. I'm worried that I may have been exposed to HIV. I want to take medications to reduce my risk. And if you get in as soon as possible, ideally less than 72 hours, ideally less than five days, um, yes, we can use drugs in that situation. There is a bit of a debate on there whether or not we can use Truvada just by itself in that situation, or we need to add another medication to that regimen. Um, I'm not sure that's anything that we're going to clearly get an answer on at any point. That's not the trial that I think is going to do. Say, you group, we're going to do two drugs. You group, we're going to do three drugs. Oops, turns out three drugs is really important. Sorry, those you who came positive in the two drug group. Um, I don't think it's a study that needs to do at any point. Um, so it might be the same medication. The question about kind of this prep on demand that you're talking about, I think, is a really compelling one. Because you're right, there are some people who feel that you know, a risky event might be something that happens twice a year for them. Are they really going to take a medication every day throughout that entire year um, for something that may happen pretty infrequently? There are people that are looking into this possibility that have come up with some suggestions. Um, the problem with most of the research that's been done so far is it's been very, very small numbers of people, so maybe very difficult to um, really help to make apply to the larger population. And most of the people that have been part of these studies 
have taken Truvada pretty frequently. So like they find on average that in a month these people are taking the medication like 15 times. So when we see um, influences on risk, should we look at that as someone who's taking PrEP only kind of intermittently um, now and then? Or do we more look at that as someone who like they would be on PrEP but they're just not taking it um, with with as good adherence as we would hope? So that's kind of one that's a long way of saying stay tuned for that one. <laughs> and then I think we have one question online and then oh we don't. Okay. And I think we're coming to the end of our question, but if there's any one more? Yeah, I'd just like to know how you're talking about this to the population. I think it's separated from the support um, the highest risk population or the population where the most new exposure are coming from men. How do to those populations out? And are those studies being done? And that particular group of people. Well, I think we're Stephen because I can, you know. Oh, okay. So how are you? Um, if you uh, have another mic, basically, how are you reaching the most, um, the targeting the populations most at for prep, the CDC and everyone, um, which would be um, according to the CDC, men, um, sex with men, um, black, and then also transgender. Uh, um, so I can speak from the perspective of Colin Lord, which um, I think actually has sort of values and uh, ethics that are true women. And, you know, you do the sort of math, like get a person, trying to get everyone aware of the information. But then I think what's really important is that when you have a person in front of you, you treat them as an individual. You talk to them specifically. You don't treat them as a demographic. You don't say you're a young and of color. But I need to pay special attention to you. They right? to treat you that way. Right? You address the person in front of you, find out what is going on in their lives, what's going on in their sexual risk. Um, and you should start to explore, you know, why they make the decisions that they make, and are they comfortable with those decisions, do they want to make those decisions. And so you work with them as an individual, and then they are able to empower themselves because they're no longer demographic. They're no longer seen as black, young, and that's right? Or, you know, like the young trans, young woman. They are looked at as a person, and you're able to really allow the person to make the decision that makes the most sense for them. And so, you know, you want to get as many people in the door as possible. You want to definitely get the demographic that have high risk for HIV in the door. So when they're in your door, when they're sitting in front of you, you treat them as a person, you deal with the person. That's accurate. You know, there are a lot of young kids, sex workers, kids, who are wherever they are, places for for that work that we are that are there plans to I mean I, I guess you can talk about the people the interior of I don't know like you know wonder how we get beat the younger younger you're speaking up to our vocation a doctor or even the don't get share. Um thank you for that. Um so with the work that we're doing especially with the work that we're doing with Latina Network, we're out um in the community um you know providing them with HIV testing and um, during uh, the time of the testing, that's where we also inform them around, you know, ways to stay negative. And we have literature with us that we're able to present to them. In addition to that, when we're promoting testing, when we're promoting any other type of referrals, you know, we we speak to everyone. So, you know, if we're at, we're at our, our time club, we, we try to engage everyone in conversation around that. And um, it, it works very well because people start to get receptive around, you know, learning more about PrEP. And when they see, they see us there regularly providing services, it's like they're like, well, you know what, I was thinking about it, you know, last week you told me about this. How can I get more informed or how can I get linked to services? So we try to fast track um, a lot of our community, you know, um, to get access to medical services. Um, which can be at different um, places throughout the city. We have also created a smart map on our website, Transitina Network, which um